set up, and I think that that is all I need to do. Uh, welcome to uh, the December 5th, I believe, uh, episode of Mindful and Heartbroken. Um, tonight, uh, it is uh, a continuation in our Sacrificial Poet series, um, but this one I've titled An Epigraph, uh, Arguments from Absurdity, and so... I'll go into a little bit of what that means in a minute. But first, uh, as always, it is really important for me to say that anything and everything that is expressed um, in the next hour is said or played only because I think it should be played and uh, that uh, nothing is reflective of the ideals or ideas of Whitworth University or any of its affiliates. Um, they've been very, very kind to me in continuing to let me, uh, play a poetry, which is something that I love. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> a couple quick notes in order to further go on. Uh, for those who are unaware, an epigraph is, I'm actually going to pull this straight off of Wik Wikipedia. In literature, an epigraph is a phrase, quotation, or poem that is set at the beginning of a document or component. Uh, the epigraph may serve as a preface, a summary, a counterexample, or to link the work to a wider literary canon, um, either to invite comparison or to enlist a, co a conventional context. And so, uh, so our epigraph, uh, our epigraph for this series is going to be a poem by Neil Hilborn. I have introduced him previously. Uh, when I believe it was two weeks ago, I uh, played One Color, um, which was a duo with uh, him. And so what what's going to happen, um, instead of our usual call to worship and then... Uh, Ben, uh, benediction at the end today we are going to go through uh, what I'm calling a an argument from absurdity and so what that is is when you start with something and you flip it inside out and prove that it can't be true um, and so I kind of got the idea because my brother gave me a hard time saying that poetry is always so much complaining and so this is my argument against his proposition that poetry is always complaining um, and so I'm going to start with him, uh, telling him that he is absolutely right and then move through a lot of things showing that he is absolutely wrong. Um, and that simply we are, we are celebrating and so that's where we're going to end up. But first we are going to, um, enjoy one of my favorite poems by uh, a poet who is a rising star in my list of, uh, favorites. And this is Neil Hilborn reading his piece audiobook. purchasing the audiobook of How to Ruin Your Life for Fun and Profit, as read by the author, Neil Hilborn. <laughs> so, you want to be unhappy. You probably think that you need to be in pain to be an interesting person and artist, and you're right. People who care about you will tell you that you don't need to suffer to be important, but just remember, musicians are always most popular the day after they die. So, are you ready to matter to someone? Step one, hate yourself. You are, presumably, a human being between the ages of alive and dead. So, chances are, you're already there. Congratulations! Step two, fall in love. People will tell you that this takes years, but we have a secret method that will allow you to fall for anyone in under a week. The trick is, you must be completely unable to tell the difference between love and codependence. Step three, fall in love again. People will tell you that this is impossible, given the love already inside you, but they don't know you. Your heart is limitless. Your heart is a well that goes all the way down. You can fit everyone in there. But, but remember to lie about it. Love can't exist with knowledge of other love. Step four, at this point you may be, you may be debating your, your decision to totally fuck up your life. So ask yourself, would you rather be happy or interesting? Would you rather be on the news or just watching it? Happy people don't make history. Happy people make children, then die. Step five, develop 
mental mental disorder that makes you aloof and impossible to contact. When someone accuses you of being a bad person, call them insensitive. Instant moral superiority. Step six. All of the elements are in place. Now, start sabotaging your own life. This isn't crazy. This is research. This is material. This is necessary for your personal growth. Step seven. You've been in love with two people for a while now. Tell them about each other. Whichever one stays, it's the winner. Step eight. Tell you, call your boss a fascist dog fucker. Tell your friends fun lies about your other friends. Tell your mother she was the reason you tried to kill yourself. It just isn't depression without total isolation. Nine, do something to hurt yourself. It may be a bicycle accident. It may be a razor. Literal or not, make yourself bleed. Step 10, create something. Paint your scars on the side of a building. Write a poem and shout it at strangers. The misery circus is parading into town and you are holding the banner. Miles of people are following you. They are all wearing gray, a rainbow of gray. They are all watching as they kick themselves bloody on their own feet. You have scars and everyone wants to kiss them. This is stigmata pornography. This is inspiration. You are why they are still alive. You are mourning in a world of midnights. You are so brave. And they want to be brave just like you. Look at what you have built. Everything you loved is gone. Tell yourself it was worth it. So that was Neil Hilborn with Audiobook. Oh, it looks like I am having some technical difficulties. Uh, I guess I'm going to continue for the sake of the recording, which... Hmm. I don't know. Uh, we'll see what can happen. But first, uh, and this might be even more strange now. Um, originally, I was going to play a different poem by Jared Singer. Jared Singer is a beautiful, uh, brilliant poet. I got to see him at Newpick this year. I think he made it to the finals um, and was phenomenal. Uh, I loved everything he read. He's from New York. I wish I had a more... Uh, flushed out bio of him but I did not have that with me uh didn't have quite as much time to prepare as I wish I had um and I was going to play a different poem by him later on but uh this one I kind of wanted to play for something that is going to end up happening in just a moment or two um so this is going to be uh Jared Singer how I learned my ABCs A is for my Aunt Clara, Betty, Charles, Dorothy. E is for everyone as in, some days it feels like everyone is dead, Francesca. G is for God as in, please, God, do not make me bury any more of my loved ones. It is already easiest to remember my ABCs by those I have lost. I beg of you, don't make it any easier to remember Henley. I, I wonder if when I'm gone, the letter J will remind other people of me, Jared, just like it already reminds me of Jeff, John, and Jacob. K is for Catherine. She broke my heart. I wished that she would die. She did. Now I am so much more careful about the things that I whisper. L is for Lewis, the name of both my best friend and my father. It's only a matter of time before I have to mourn it. Molly. Maggie, Matt, and is for no, is in no, I will not say your name yet. I am not willing to admit that you are gone. O is for the great state of Oregon, one of only three I have not had to bury anyone in, yet P is for prayers, and there is only so much time in the day to pray, so every time one of my loved ones dies, the rest get just a little bit more of my attention. I know it's sick, but I wonder how many more have to bite the dust before I can save the rest. Q is my favorite letter. I've never met anyone whose name starts with the letter Q, so I know I'll never have to mourn it. Robert, RJ, Rebecca, Sally, Samantha, Sarah, Trevor, Trey, Thomas, you is for understand why I do not cry at funerals anymore. I know that if I were to start, I would not be able to stop until it drowned us all. V is for victory, as in you always beat us at everything. It was only your nickname, but you did always beat us at everything, even getting to the grave first. W is for wonders, and I wonder how many more names I will have to add to this list. Y is for Yossi. I cried on the day that you died, but not because you were gone, 
But because I had to tell her that I never wanted to speak to her again, Z is for zoo. As in, I bet I could fill an entire zoo with my dead. And now I've learned my ABCs. What will I learn tomorrow? So, um, the reason that I ended up playing that poem instead is because uh, today um, we have another reason to mourn for uh, the letter M. Um, uh, today, uh, Nelson Mandela passed away at the uh, age of 95, uh, and he uh, was a brilliant man. I'm going to go look at it on Wikipedia again real quick, just so I don't mess up anything up. Um, he was a South African anti-apartheid revolutionary, a politician who served as uh, president of South Africa from 1994 to 1999. Um, he was the first black South African to hold the office uh, and the first elected in a fully representative uh, multi-racial election in the government. Um, uh, he His government focused on dismantling the legacy of apartheid through tackling institutionalized racism, poverty, and inequality, and fostered racial reconciliation uh i know that he is a hero to many he is uh, an encouragement to all and uh definitely someone i wish i knew more about um and so it's been put to me that i should uh that we should have a moment of silence um just in quiet contemplation for that so uh, if you'll take a moment with me Thanks for that. Um, all right, so up next we have uh, Carlos uh, Andreas Gomez um, and Jean-Anne Verlee doing a duet titled Wait. You told him he was a good man. I want to point you out in a crowded room say, that's my wife, but... His mouth is full of splinters. I associate marriage with death. Last night I couldn't sleep. Heard wedding bells in the street. His name is a clock you hang above the stove. You wait. He wants to be your husband. You wait. He wants to run. You wait. <laughs> a quiet elephant I drag everywhere I go. Attached at the neck by an invisible leash. Babies reach for your breasts from passing strollers. Your hips are an invitation. invitation. Your face, a love letter. You wait. I want to watch the years build altars of your face. He is beautiful in the morning. Nestles, Nestles into, into your chest, chest as if you are something worth needing. needing. His eyes are a tree. I want to fuck half of Manhattan. <laughs> Forget their names and call myself complex. <laughs> Pairs of pearl glossed lips, chestnut braids. He feeds you his smile like a string of candy gemstones. You told me I was a good man. But I am mere man, flesh, flesh and, and cheap whiskey. whiskey. His promises are gospel. His skin, flint, flint spark. spark. I want to raise a defiant daughter, a curious, sensitive boy with my mouth and your hair. The kitchen in your future is full of living. Children, Children and, and toy, toy cars, cars, rainbows crammed into counters. You wait. I am a simple, easy way out kind of fool. His voice is the sound of gears rotating in the hollow of a bell tower. All you want is a pretty lovebird to sing you to sleep. I never want to lose who I am. Something must be surrendered. Could not forgive myself if you I ever, ever had, had to, to walk, walk out. out. I imagine my mother, abandoned in a marriage, her face flood ravaged. I see her now, proud, proud lonely, lonely, free, free. single plates at a table for six. When did your lips become echo? Why couldn't you stop him? I want to be a better man, more than this circus show of impulse and ache. Or did he just go, pack a satchel and, and run? run. Where, Where am I running? running? I'm scared of coming home to an empty house. Why are the dead the only ones you can love? I will be there. I wait. Don't you want to cut it out of you? That incessant thrumming. thrumming. This, this life, life is a hard dying, dying. A sick everlasting. everlasting. I you call, call yourself fool. Say these good hearts. hearts. You give, God. You give. I am neither hero 
Dragonor monster. You gave me permission for what I am. He is a man bound and bellowing, coated, coated in, in sugar. sugar. I dream, I dream someone, someone is always reaching for your hand, hand, kissing my sturdy neck. neck. I want, want to die in your arms. arms. I'm just trapped between maybe, maybe and, and should. should. Childhood nightmares and fatherhood dreams. How, How long, long before, before I just leap? Say, say love, yes, say yes. Love. Slowly, Slowly the song the crawls from my throat. throat. My your fingers are a nest of tangled thorns. I want to be a better man, but... I you wait. wait. That was Gina and Rilly and uh, Andre Carlos Andres Gomez. Uh, up next, we have Carrie Ruzinski. Uh, I talked about her a little bit for during my Women of the World uh, or Women of the World of Poetry uh, section. Uh, she was best female poet at NPS 2008. Uh, she represented Boston for uh, IWIPS in 2010, um, and she was a runner-up at New Pick for 2011. Um, and she is marvelous. And so this is her poem, The Fifth One Who Walked Away. For the first boy I ever loved, I drove five hours across an ocean of cornfields to crawl into his heat. Every time I left, he cut off one of my fingers and kept it in a clear jar under his bed. I wept the whole drive home. A trail of blood to find my way back. The second boy was just a distraction. The hum of the television and a pair of swollen eyes. He gnawed at my wrists like an ugly puppy. I would have tasted good even if I'd never spoken. The third was a fleet of sailboats spilling out across my tongue. A pair of calloused palms, desperation licking my teeth. I was not so pretty when he opened his eyes. The fourth sewed my mouth shut so I could only dance inside myself with heavy shoes so I could pretend I loved him in desperate gestures so I could unravel in his tired fists. My hands have been fools. They could not have been prepared for you. I talked them into your pockets, filled their empty bellies with your beautiful lies, my strange American desert, my warm endless night, I did not know to fear the hands that loved you before my own. You stained her all over me, left the windows open while I slept in your bed, washed me with a sponge doused in her spit every night. I watched you slit off my skin and hang it on her bones. I could not open my mouth for fear she would come spilling out. Now I have been silent for so long. My fingers are tiny blind worms dancing in the night. I tell them stories of our life before the darkness, but I do not know if they believe me. I do not know if they recognize my own voice. That was Carrie Ruzinski. Up next, uh, something that I try to do a lot is uh, play a poem that was released within the last week. I know that sounds kind of silly, but um, I like having something that's pretty brand new and I also like having one or two that are pretty old um, and so this one is uh, very very new um, it's by Michael Lee I know absolutely nothing about him but I really um, actually no this is a different one eh, it's still pretty new it's about uh, yeah it's a little over a week old one or two um, but it's by Michael Lee I know nothing about him and it's titled Waking Up Naked I'm at a party when a kid asks me Hey, you want a drink, bro? Uh, no thanks, I don't drink anymore. That's fucking lame. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> lame. Weak. Sometimes I get to mean boring. So I'm boring. The parties I usually go to consist of coffee and feelings. A few times a week, we sit in a circle and try to piece our lives together. We don't remember them so clearly. Besides, bro, one time, when only weighing 130 pounds, I killed a bottle of Jack Daniels in 30 minutes. The next morning, I woke up in the backseat of my car naked and neck deep in leaves. I am allergic to alcohol. Every time I drink, I break out in handcuffs. <laughs> I crack on a living room carpet and then kick down a door. To date, I put three cats on a treadmill, one dog in a cupboard. You're not going to be boring, sir. Once, I forgot where my house was, was escorted by strangers, carrying 50 cookies and an umbrella, butt naked. But one time, 
I had butted my best friend so hard I shattered his nose. At one time, I took more pills than I could remember and accepted I'd be dead within the hour. Don't you dare call me weak. I have swallowed more pints of regret than you pump blood through your body. Tell my father it was boring. To look his only son in the eyes, tell him if he drank one more time, you would not be welcome in this house. Tell my mother I am weak. She, who spelled the whole back tears, driving me home for the psych ward. She, who seen a son handcuffed to an emergency room bed. She spent four years praying for my sobriety nightly. You will not take this from her. If you offer me a shot, there better be a trigger involved. Yeah. The strongest I have ever felt was the first time I said no to a drink. Woo! I have said no every morning since September 29th, 2008. I say no 18 times before breakfast, one for every step, and just get from my bedroom to the fridge. I say no 10 times before work, one for every billboard that tells me I was stronger when I was drinking. I've said no more times than I can count. One for every night my family lay awake trying not to imagine my head stung. You ask me the question, I do not hear the words you are saying. I hear you ask me, do you want to die, Michael? No, I don't want to die anymore. So that was Michael Lee with uh, Waking Up Naked. Um, that These next couple of poems are a little bit of the turn through this argument, um, the way that arguments work, uh, arguments from absurdity, you start out with premise A, um, and you're trying to prove that that's true, so then you change it to not A, uh, and from there you continue through whatever other premises you have and prove that at some point in time there's a contradiction, because you've put in a contradiction by flipping that one. Um, and so our, our epitaph, or ep epigraph, I'm sorry, it was our, um, was our not A. And now we're working through the arguments and trying to see sort of, sort of how things are turning, how things are coming to light and showing um, how much poetry can be life-giving and showing, showing someone's determination, showing someone's power, showing someone's story and where they've come from and where they're going through and what they've fought through and what they can do. So... Um, uh, it's it's going to get a little stranger um, in a minute. And so this is my brand new poem. Um, I think uh, Button Poetry published it a day or two ago. Um, it's Dave Mc McAlinden. I have no idea who he is, but I really enjoyed this piece. It's, uh, from, it's from Nationals, but I didn't see him in person. And this is titled, If I Was Your God. This poem is dedicated to the Holy Roman Catholic Church, politicians everywhere, the New York Yankees, and everyone else who keeps fucking up my shit. <laughs> if I was a Bible writer, I would do a lot of editing. I would decree religion a hell-worthy trespass, turn dogma to paradox, a burning bush into a magnavox. Lightning would be enlightening, and every baseball team would be the Red Sox, that's right. Baseball would be in the Bible, because a Bible without baseball is flat out on American. <laughs> and if I was the Pope, Vatican City would be as beautiful and as antiquarian as it ever was, but prayers for absolution, listing from the lips of priests, would be sweet whispers to their husbands or wives, and the pale holy light through the stained glass pleats, that's right, priests could get down. Because if I was a holy man, I'd still want to get down. And I think that a priest could get down, and we could cut down on child molestation in the church. I'm just saying. Yes, the holy bone could be the stone that kills those two birds. <laughs> and since I'm probably going to hell for this poem anyway, if I was your god, I would sprinkle wine out into the night so when you looked up to it to wither time away with questions to me, you'd be so drunk with the moment. You'd forget all about being saved and start seeing that the only way to be saved is to save yourself by just being and hold it. See, if I was a therapist, you probably wouldn't want to go to me. <laughs> but I would listen like a best friend on Adderall. <laughs> and I would answer all of your questions in plain language, possibly offer the exact advice you were looking for, though I know you'd never take it. And if I was a politician, <laughs> If I was a dick, I would fuck you. No need to thank me, just doing my job. You know, because a dick and a politician, they're both designed to, you know, they're really good. If I was omnipotent and I could change things, I'd probably start out by doing a bunch of weird shit that always seems to pop up in my dreams, like turn telephone booths into teleportation points. That would be wicked fucking awesome. I would fuck a cloud into a monsoon, make all of your favorite moments possible to clone. I would light bottle rockets to bloom into tulips. 
when they floated down, I would bend a pitchfork into a saxophone to blow the sky into the ground so we could have a soundtrack with a playback of our fantasies. I would turn Korans into Bibles, Bibles into Korans, show that words of love in another language could be read as a battle plan, so I'd turn wars into carnivals and fists into hands to make musical instruments out of killing tools. If I was an artisan, I would give you my hands. But I'm sorry to say I'm afraid I just play that age-old role of a fool because maybe I still believe in God just in case. And no, I've never read the Bible. I don't know the first thing about baseball. I just said that to get you to like me. <laughs> and I can't name the Pope. I don't even vote. And I've never been to a therapist before. I'm too shit scared that I might actually have to deal with a problem. And nobody, nobody, nobody has limitless power. That's why they all want it so bad. Yet here we are, still just talking about all the things we do if we had. So that was Dave McAlinden, is how I'm going to pronounce his name. It's M-C-A-L-I-N-D-E-N. -E um, and that was his poem, If I Was Your God. Uh, so the next poem that I would have played would have been Jared Singer's autobiography. It is hilarious and beautiful and marvelous and I think you should go check it out on your own because I do not believe I shall have time with it uh, for it because I replaced uh, that piece with the ABC piece I played earlier um, and up next is one of my favorite poets well he was on my top five but he has since um, declined a little bit not because I love him any less but because uh, he hasn't produced anything in years um, and so John Reeves, more commonly known as Reeves, has uh, he's he he is now producing a great uh, a great many things, but very few of them are poetry related. Um, you should check out his TED lectures. I believe he has six of them now. Uh, and this is the first poem I ever really memorized, uh, and it is his poem titled "Nickel." You might be the prettiest pedestrian ever ever to move your dress across an intersection raise your hand and hail the wind to lift your very last ankle into a taxi cab like an antelope trying to keep its horseshoe out of harm's way and if i had a nickel for every time i thought that so far i would have five nickels <laughs> which is 25 cents and that's not a lot of money but it's just enough coinage to travel back in time and call your parents from a phone booth on the day you were born. Tell them, don't let this one leave me later. What? Ah, oh, this is just an asshole from the future. See? <laughs> you dazzled me with the horsepower of your metaphors. You put the us in genius. You were like a nap. And I was the boy going, no, I don't want a nap. No, I'm not tired. That was me. Nice work. And what next? Smarty panties. Do you really not remember rainbow weather? Headbutts in the hotel bed, the bashful maid made badly. We only had ice cubes to snack on, but I would have bitten the label off your apple if you let me. And that was the time you bet me that nowhere was someplace flattery was going to get me. And then half an hour later, we're fucking your earrings off, so either you... <laughs> have really crappy standards or I'm an understander you can wrap your vida loca around. I know that the hydrant on the corner of your memory and your diary is not only open, it's 90 proof. The alphabet blocks from your childhood never really got a decent burial. If we were all birds, you would still be left-handed and you are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. But you're not my only sunshine. No, see, I got other sunshine. Oh, I would doggy style Nancy Drew if I got a chance. And who could blame me? She's a cutie pie with her retro hairstyle and her mystery solving intuition. Now, I'm just teasing you like a thorough lover does because you always said that I've got smart ass on remote control. And I always said, oh, I'm not even remotely controllable. Look. I don't stand as close to folding mirrors as I used to. For years, my ATM code was considerate because I wasn't, but I am pro-nap now. I'm your 10 biggest fans, and yes, I'm envious of all the foreign ink in your passport. And no, you shouldn't go off and give blowjobs without me. And obviously, your dimple 
And your dimple, oh, your goddamn dimples are so garish. Even golf balls get self-conscious. And if I had a nickel for every time I thought that so far, I would have a nickel <laughs> right here. Heads or tails? Jefferson or Monticello? What's it gonna be, smarty panties? Because you cannot turn a taxi cab around. That was hours ago. And you cannot turn an airplane around. Only NASA can do that. And you cannot travel back in time to have smart ass conversations with Mr. and Mrs. your mom and dad. Only I can do that. Me, the guy you used to floss in front of. I just wish we just had letter writing. Sometimes I am so spot on with the unspontaneous. I tell you, that I miss you. Your face is untranslatable. My sky is absent now of everything but dullest overhead. Oh, you, the vintage partner on my dance card. I can write you. I could tell you. I would show you. I should say, you know, just, just wow, by the way. Thank you. So that was Reeves with Nickel. Uh, I love that poem uh, so very, very dearly. Um, up next, it's another poem from Jared Singer. It is titled Liberty Bell. I have always wanted to be your Liberty Bell. It wasn't beautiful, but it was perfectly designed without flaw in its manufacture or its metal, yet still, when the same note was struck four times in a row, it cracked down the center. I want to be the thing that turns theory into fact for you. I want to be the proof that an object in harmony with itself is capable of destroying anything, even itself. I know that there are days where that will be hard to remember, but whenever you forget, just remind yourself that every bell built since has had flaws purposefully put into it to keep its own perfection from ripping it in half. I need you to understand why I get too loud too often in too many of my performances yet still write love poems whose every word I believe in. If you think these are unrelated, I need you to put down your bottle, your book, or your swagger and just be honest with yourself. Those of us who believe wholeheartedly in love have more reason to scream. It will leak into everything we do. This is not a reason to pity us. This is a reason for us to be proud. We are the mountain. If you have ever heard that a river will always wear down a mountain. I'm here to tell you that that is so much bullshit. <laughs> that we mountains are just smart enough to know we can never take ourselves as far as we deserve to go. So we hand a tiny piece of ourselves to every passing river. One day the rivers will be gone, so will the mountains, but you will not build future generations on dry riverbeds. You will build them on me. We wanted it this way. We wanted this rabid dog lonely, this never enough, this always try harder. So that was Jared Singer with uh, Liberty Bell. Up next, we have Omar Holman. Omar was another one I believe I uh, played during the uh, duos and team pieces section. Uh, he is a poet from New York. He's been on Urbana several times. Uh, and I wish I had better bios for everyone this evening. Um, but I guess what that just means is that uh, you got to go out and look for them yourselves. So this is Omar Holman, O-M-A-R-H-O-L-M-O-N. And it is titled... For mild-mannered girls attempting to build ghost ships. The documentary of our What Almost Was got nominated for Best Picture of the Year for the way it broke the conventional, you want to grab a cup of coffee sometime, of romantic comedies. I wanted to congratulate you on your nomination for Best Lead Actress in the role of girl that smells of shorelines and Sunday mornings. I'm sure we can both agree God is going to win Best Director. Again, you should know, there isn't another actress on 
or offset that can make my blood run clumsy like you. Your suggestion that my palms should cup your face like oasis water during our kissing scenes was movie magic subtle. The rain came background music slow. The scene that followed was the most honest monologue I've ever performed. I went off script and told you, you made everything make sense. Gave purpose to each gear in this clockwork that this compass in the pocket I called a chest refused to point anywhere else but west. Back there, then, now, wherever your vicinity is, and after I confessed, the most honest I've ever known, the close-up that captured the brown girl of your cheek, blushing sunrise in full bloom, didn't soften the delivery in the line. When you told me that the 15 minutes of fame into my finest hour was on another man's time, this was when I realized the glass house is half full. The screen then splits to my montage of auditions for roles that weren't me, drinker, atheist, hypocrite, love, falling somewhere between sugar pill and suicide mission. This compass drowning in the wishing well of my stomach and then my humor, dying off like jarred fireflies. They say fruit flies have a gene named after the Tin Man from the Wizard of Oz because if the gene isn't present, the flies do not develop a heart. I have been trying to act like rumors of my heart have been greatly exaggerated but it is one year later and you still go ship through my subconscious still can't bring myself to throw the man I was going to be for you overboard still telling myself ghost ships don't drop anchor when I see his reflection instead of my own then I realize maybe this is the point in the movie where it stops being about the girl and more about the man I thought I was supposed to be Nikola Tesla believed there is no thrill that can go through the human heart like that felt by the inventor as he sees some creation of the brain unfolding to success. So I've taken up building ships in a bottle. It's amazing how the tedious of it can be overshadowed by the sight of crafting something so gorgeous in the empty of what once was I built one for you. A ship made out of a memory. The last blueprint of a man I intended to become, I know it will never set sail, but most days that doesn't stop it from trying to raise anchor. I adore that piece. It's uh, actually um, a piece that didn't make it in uh, for this evening is also by Jared Singer. And it's a, a love letter from an entomologist, which has to do with bugs. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate it. I wanted to put those two back to back because the firefly reference or the, the, the flies reference. Um, I'm curious, though, uh, how far and how well my logic has been tracking for some people. Um, Jared, when he cried that, uh, you know, I, 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 I keep yelling and have all the more reason to be proud. Um, I definitely just you brought those two lines together across 40 seconds of other imagery, but what are you gonna do? Um, and then Omar um, saying I tried out for other roles that were not mine. Uh, anyways. Up next, we have Jesse Parent. Uh, Jesse is, let alone an amazing poet, he's an amazing man. Um, he helped me out for a project for my evangelism and discipleship class uh, because he so often writes about um, faith, but not not so much in the, the pro prophet poets of, uh, look at how shiny my faith can be, but... Um, gets real down into the dirt of it. Um, he's got a poem titled Hooked Cross. He's got one about, um, he's got one that is, uh, Lazarus that is, uh, all about, um, sort of calling Christ a coward. Uh, and he's got one Barabbas that is a, uh, social commentary. So beyond him being a brilliant poet, he's this absolutely amazing man. Um, and it's been my pleasure to get to know him across this last year. Uh, and so this is, um, we just did a, a poem about relationships. We've done plenty of poems about relationships in the past and in this week. Uh, and so this one is kind of turning things uh, up and lighter a little bit, uh, showing, uh, showing a father's love in a certain point. And so this is To the Boys Who May One Day Date My Daughter by Jesse Parent. To the boys who may one day date my daughter. I have been waiting for you. Since before her birth, since my, before my spark took hold and ignited the fire in her mother's belly, I have been training to kill you. 
When you took your first steps, I was preparing to make it so you never walked again. When you played at war, I was perfecting headshots. You can't catch up at this point. <laughs> and when you first see my daughter and fall in love with the look she sends over her shoulder, her crescent moon eyes framing her laughing smile, you are going to want to talk to her. And when those hours pass by like sprinters during that first timeless conversation, you will also know with a deep and unspoken dread that you are going to have to talk to me. When you first come to my home and see the bone carving over my threshold, try not to imagine your own femur so expertly carved. Pay no attention to my ample crawl space, my room with a rubber mat and a drain. Be careful to only approach me with love from my daughter. See, I have been seeding her childhood with taproot hugs to weed out indifference and apathy. There will be no daddy issues for your teenage talents to latch upon. If you break her heart, I will hear it snap with the ear I pressed against her mother's belly. The elbow I cradled her head in will send a message to my fists, my cheeks are attuned to her lips. I will know if they tremble. I have taught her that a man should never hit a woman. Her mother would like to add that she really shouldn't ever hit anybody, but I have taught her that a man should never hit a woman. Consider my genes a mark of Cain. You will suffer seven times whatever you do to her, and she will not keep your secrets. You can't make fire feel afraid. I have been trying to teach her love all of her life, all I ask is that you continue the lesson. Love her, befriend her, protect her, be there when I can't. And when my body gives up to the grave, let the grin eternity carves into my face be a reflection of the peace that your love brings to her. And we should get along just fine. <laughs> Addendum. <laughs> to the girl who may one day date my daughter. My wife is a better shot than I am. I love the way that he ends that poem um, for exactly that reason. <sighs> Coming on the up and up. Uh, this is another poet whom I do not know. It is taken from uh, the College Union Poetry Slam Invitational. So Cupsy of 2013. Um, he's named Simone Stolzoff. Uh, and this was published in April. Uh, and as much as I enjoy this piece, I'm really excited for how it pairs with the piece after it. Um, and after that we actually don't have too many more that come through uh so yeah this is simone with boyfriend material do you know what kind of material this is it's boyfriend material and i don't oh! care if i can say that every single mountain top would sound like a fucking josh groban song to let you ladies know exactly what i am because i'll cuddle up watching a joseph gordon Levin movie with you I'll admit I know all the words that John Mayer song you love. I'll tell your mom that her zucchini frittata was divine. And I'll tell your dad that of course I follow the PGA tour because I'm boyfriend material. How many girlfriends have I had? A lot. Binders full of girlfriends. So tell me, so tell me I'm not qualified to write this poem. I don't treat women like objects. I treat women like the ocean treats the shore. And I know those are both objects, but they're really beautiful, poetic objects about boyfriend material. I don't want this to sound like my okay Cupid profile. I want this to sound like my fucking incredible Cupid profile. Because ladies, I got some cold hard facts for you and they're harder than my abs and colder than fucking Minnesota fat. This one time, I wrote a girl a letter on a piece of paper and I sent it in the mail fat. I did Bikram yoga once. Fact. I wear a v-neck shirt and read books, next question. I'm not saying that I'm underrated, just underappreciated. Like good pressure at a water fountain. Like stretching, like firm red grapes. What I'm trying to say is, ladies, 
I'm here to get the job done, like like Liam Neeson. No, like like WT40, no. Like like a vibrator. Actually, fuck that. Better than a vibrator. But for real. I'm tired of all these girls saying that there aren't any good guys out there. And they're looking for someone to prove them wrong. So to all you beautiful women. And all you hard guys trying to get in touch with your sensitive side, know that you can always look up to this white boy to help you pronounce je ne sais pas, or to tell you that you look beautiful in that romper, because at the end of every night, and when I make you an egg white omelet in the morning, know that I am motherfucking boyfriend material. Let's go! There are a few lines in there that I just can't help but adore, even though they, yeah, it's a great poem. Um, so up next we have Kate Rakowski. I'm not entirely sure, actually I'm fairly certain that I was not able to play this poem uh, earlier on. I believe I had to cut it from my second episode. Uh, Kate is beyond, once again, same th uh, one of the similar things as uh, Jesse, beyond just being an amazing poet and an amazing person. Uh, but hilariously enough, she is my oldest sister, Aaron and I's kind of shared favorite poet in the sense of um, my sister and I will always uh, quote this poem back and forth to each other, which might sound strange, uh, but I, uh, it's something that I, I find very endearing and it's a lot of fun to do. Um, and it is perfect considering which one we just played before it. Uh, speaking of though real quick i know we've been through a lot of poems with a lot of language and a lot of uh more adult concepts i gave my uh warning at the beginning and so i shall give it again now that uh there are often and always adult themes um in a lot of the poetry uh because poetry does delve into the human experience and so as such um this one i, I know especially has some uh, great images. I'm going to leave it there. It has some great images. This is Kate Rakowski with New Insults. On our first date, I warned him. I told him I'm a bit of a crazy person, but I'm not really interested in changing that shit. I am not compatible with a Zoe Deschanel rom-com because I actually love myself more than I can imagine loving somebody else. I am a stubborn mess. I am spilled milk and crying about it. I am the captain of an ever-sinking ship. He laughed, ha, huh, and told me, that's what they all say. You have no idea what you want. Like I was trapped in the tower of my own device, and he was scratching at the stone saying, girl, small thing, let down your hair. You just haven't found the right cock to complete you. I'm going to say you so hard. I would tell you to go fuck yourself, but I don't want to wish something as awesome as sex upon you. I would call you an asshole, but less shit comes out of an asshole. You, my friend, are such a specific breed of dick nut that I had to invent new insults just to accommodate how much I hate you. I hate you so much. I hope you feel like you're about to sneeze for the rest of your life. I hate you so much. I hope you're I would enjoy it if you were one of three people a year who went to jail for pirating music. I hate you so much. I hope you're forced to suck my ex-boyfriend's dick for 72 hours straight while he talks about how The Wire is the best TV show you've never seen. I hate you so much. I hope you have a popcorn kernel stuck in the back of your throat forever. I hate you so much. I hope you fall in love with a strong woman. One who loves herself more than you. I hate you so much. I hope you know where you stand. That she will never stray from her path with that dizzy pinwheel heart. I hate you so much. I hope you marry her. And I think about the way you treated me. About the night you called me manic. Insulted me to my face. And still insisted you pay for dinner. I hate you so much. I hope you regret it. I hope you kiss your loved one full on the mouth. And feel foolish that she this vision of spinning and wonder. She, with the hard heart and the sharp tongue, she, with the blinding bright future, would ever change for someone as undeserving as you. 
that poem has one of the best turns I have ever heard uh, in my years of listening to poetry. Uh, just, I hope you fall in love with a strong woman. Uh, that moment when, um, for lack of a better term, when uh, term uh, when the stuff hits the fan. Um, I've gotten reprimanded for swearing before, so I have to be careful. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, so that was Kate Rakowski with New Insults. Uh, she is marvelous and an absolute, um, just really an amazing person. I really enjoyed getting to meet her at Nationals. Uh, up next, oh wow, we really are coming on to the end of this. This might even be a short one. Um, I will debate during this poem if I want to reinsert uh, autobiography between uh, this and our last poem. But this is, once again, Neil Hilborn with Static Electricity. In second grade, we did an experiment with static electricity. We rubbed balloons on our heads and stuck them to walls. And kissing you is kind of like that. My hair stands on end, I get shocked when I touch things, and I want to tell you stupid stuff like kissing you is a bundle of kittens <laughs> colliding with my face at 0.5 miles an hour. It's like being shot with a dart gun made of hummingbirds that shoots darts made of hummingbirds. And your lips are so soft, I can't actually tell when we're touching, like braiding hair underwater or napping under a blanket filled with rainbows and clouds and your favorite books. When you kiss me, the cartoon devil and angel on my shoulder climb into my ears, lick on my neurons, and start fucking on my brainstem. And if you were a 300-pound professional weightlifter and I were a Kia Sorento, <laughs> you could drag me anywhere with your lips. <laughs> Kissing you was patient and impossibly slow like peeling paint off of a wall with glittery stickers or cooking a turkey with a lighter. <laughs> Knowing I would someday kiss someone who kisses like you is why I let them give me braces, why I even wore my headgear to school. And you remind me of the time in second grade when Bethany Hopkirk called me a freak face and stabbed me in the arm with a pencil, cuz kissing you was kinda like that unhealthy, and will probably result in disfigurement, but baby, bring on the facial scars and lead poisoning. Because when you kiss me, you are dangling me off a bridge by my belt. You are the screen door of my childhood, all teeth and swinging, so full of holes you could never keep anything in. You are every black eye, you're a semi-truck, and I'm a turtle with two broken legs and a broken heart. You are illegal fireworks, falling downstairs together, driving on four flat tires, playing frisbee at night with a saw blade, kissing you is like falling falling out of a 37th story window, exploding into a cloud of robins, and reappearing on the ground with my mouth full of feathers. <laughs> <laughs> and when I can't kiss you, I try to find the static electricity in my apartment. I dig around in wall sockets, I change light bulbs with my teeth, and I make out with the toaster. <laughs> and I know, I know, we've only been seeing each other for a couple weeks, but Baby, when you kiss me, I can't remember my middle name or which one is my left foot. So come over tonight. We'll shuffle around the apartment in our socks and we'll let our lips drift toward each other like tectonic plates made out of kittens. <laughs> Well, that was a little quick. Um, I'm actually going to pause this because I can. Because why not? And we're back. Alrighty. Uh, so, up next, and this is going to be um, our benediction. And so I'll, I'll end up closing it out a little bit after this. But this is um, the moment to kind of end this argument ad absurdum. Um, it is to uh, talk about all the things that can go wrong, but all the things that uh, we can really appreciate that can go right. Um, very uh, a minor minor similarity to two weeks ago, but yeah. And so this is uh, Good Ghost Bill and Kevin Burke with their Brome. Um, one note: uh, you can purchase uh, Good Ghost Bill's uh, albums on Bandcamp for donation. But I do believe that this is where he gets his primary income from. For so I think that you should donate a significant amount for that. 
Um, so right now we have Kevin Burke and Good Ghost Bill for Brome. How am I doing? Is this working now? I think it is. Why not? Okay, so, uh, <laughs> um, so we just played the uh, played the brome, and so sort of what I want to come to for tonight's benediction was the idea of uh, um, finding meaning in our relationships, finding meaning in each other, in uh, in love, and in the people around us. Uh, a lot of the things that cause us uh, trouble are um, our anxieties concerning one another or, uh, you know, missing someone from a long distance or missing someone as they've passed. Um, and because uh, oh, there's a quote. Um, oh, ironically, I think it was, we were talking about it in ethics. Uh, the... You can tell the importance of something by how big of a hole it leaves once it's gone. Um, and with Nelson Mandela, a man with a, uh, with a large and grave and beautiful um, importance and legacy behind him, uh, it, 
he he will be sorely missed with a big hole in many hearts um more than just the ones he touched personally but also uh those he inspired um so i guess uh what all of this has been leaning up towards and what i've been trying to come to is showing that through our um through both our actions and our words uh the words of uh, poets sharing their stories, the words of um, politicians changing the world for the better, um, the words of uh, pastors preaching hope, um, and the actions of our families, of our friends, of our classmates, uh, even as we struggle through finals, um, we can remember that <laughs> there is something so beautiful um, in being there uh, when you're needed or um, finding that when you need someone that they're there. Uh, in the Brome, one of my favorite lines is, when I drank myself under the table, you were the kitchen floor. Uh, to, to be the grounding for someone. Um, because so often we are broken and uh, there's something beautiful in standing together in that brokenness, not being, um, uh, one of my favorite sayings used to be, um, that life isn't about being independent. It's about being dependent upon the right people. It's about being interdependent with the right people. It is about, uh, building relationships and there are things that I have to do, um, for the people around me. I have to get up, I have to get out of bed in the morning, uh, for my best friend. Um, I have to graduate from college, uh, for my mother. Um, you know, I have to try to live a happy life, um, for my sister. Uh, I have to try to, uh, help those around me, um, in honor of my brother. Um, because my brother has the biggest heart of anyone you will ever meet. It's astounding, really, uh, even with <laughs> how much he likes to tease me. Um, he really is an amazing man. Uh, and I know that, um, actually, I have firsthand proof that when I drank myself um, under the table that he was, uh, was the kitchen floor. Um, so, uh, for this... For this evening um, and for the rest of this week, uh, please um, try to remember that we are so much more than the stressors of these of this week. Um, that our relationships are worth uh, are worth getting up for in the morning. The worth staying up late. Uh, and that in all things, uh, we can stand together to help one another. Um, so, uh, continue to love each other and, um, to love yourselves and to find love in the world, uh, in, in the sunshine and the snow. Um, my preference is sunshine. Uh, it's been a pleasure guys. Um, I hope you have a good, uh, rest of the week. I'm not sure if I'll do a show uh, during finals week, um, and I think January will be strange with Jan term, but for now, uh, I can't wait to see you guys again. So go in pieces.